I picked up comments uh, from a conversation that you had on CNN where they looked at China's rapid growth, potentially bringing into question the hands-down success of capitalism. And you've said that there's no place for unregulated capitalism and everything has to be hybrid, whether you're looking at the US or China itself. So talk us through some of the thinking behind that. Well, that's just a statement. I, don't, I, I thought you can't, everything has to have a limit and anything can go to extreme. The, you know, I believe in a competitive system, but the, if you let competition go on unbridled, eventually someone will win and will use their position to make sure no, no one ever threatens their position ever again. So almost automatically, I mean, for, for well over 100 years, you had antitrust laws in the United States to prevent people from monopolizing, using monopoly power to stop people from competing with them ever again. And so that, by definition, is a constraint on capitalism. And you still have to do that. Capitalism produces winners, and it, has, it provides an incentive system. And some, you know, and sometimes the winners win, but the but you also need a stable society in which the losers or the people who don't win aren't losing too much or aren't in a so much of a rut. Uh, and at least, and let me put it this way, maybe the consequences of not winning aren't so uh, aren't so dire. And so you have to put in a floor. And so that all has to be tempered. And so I think um, a, a, a socialistic system that's been tested without incentives doesn't really work and you know, doesn't work at that extreme. And certainly a capitalist system where everything is incentive oriented and winner takes all obviously hasn't worked and there are examples of that. So I don't, you know, in practice now, of course, between those two poles, there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of things that have to occur in practice and rules and laws on this evolve. And you see that happening all the time. You can see the stress that's happening, you know, an antitrust suit has been filed against Google in Europe, and this is a very, and if you read the papers every day, you'll end up with a common law knowledge of antitrust law, because that's, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a functioning uh, ec uh, economic system, that's always going to be tested. Is the U.S. underestimating the rise of China as a preeminent funder in the global economy? Underestimating? Mm -hmm. um, I can't, sp I don't know, I can't speak for other people, History will show you know, the, the performance, and everybody, of course, will remember getting it just right. But I think um, I could give you, look, I've spoken on this, and I think that China is going to be, if I had to pick now, so early in this century, I think China could very well be the story of the century, the economic power of the century. In the same way, looking back, America was the economic power of the 20th century, but it's a lot easier to, to predict the past than it is to predict the future. I'm looking back at America. I know it's already ha happened. In China's case, and in the 21st century, we don't know. I could, um, and by the way, even if they do so well for so long, they could very well dominate the century economically. They won't dominate every year. U.S. had a very good 20th century. It had many bad years in that 20th century. Um, I could pick a scenario now, and again, hindsight will always be 2020. But you look what's going on in China. There's um, growth is disappointing, you know, but not by a lot. But growth is disappointing. They have to do things to take care of the, you know, they have programs to get, uh, you know, on to repair the corruption in the economic system, and in, you know, in a parallel corruption, namely the corruption of the environmental issues, that's slowing down growth in China. You could see, I could project forward and could say, gee, maybe that will drive them into a much lower growth period for a long time. I could, see a peer, I could see, on the other hand, that China, which has made very, the management managers of the Chinese economy have made a lot of right decisions. I could see it working out. Um, the near term is very hard to predict. In my point of view, it's easier to predict the, media, the middle term. When you have so much energy, so much competence in the system, so much growth already, so much dynamism, I think they're, they're going to be, do very well over the middle term and the far term. Very hard to predict whether they get out of this next period, having managed their economy slower, whether they get out of it without having it go down, uh, whether growth goes lower than they want it to go. And just last week, we had the IMF highlight uh, yet again the two-speed economy that we're looking at on a global scale. How do you see emerging markets, even frontier markets, fitting into that entire equation? If I had projected forward at the start of the century and said, what are the risks and opportunities in emerging markets, I would have said higher risk, 
ultimately higher reward, but the higher risk will mean that you'll have much more volatility and you'll go through long periods of stress and strain. Now looking, when you project that forward or you look back at a long period, you're kind of, um, you're kind of um, serene at this th hypothetical notion of you're gonna go through a lot more troughs mm -hmm. and peaks than in a developed economy that grows at a more consistent but lower rate. Life, I mean, I've been in the trading business and the market business and the sentiment business. You could talk about that in an objective clinical way, but you, when you're living through it, it never feels that way. If I said 15 years ago, we're gonna go through a period where the developed markets are gonna slow down, rates are gonna go, you know, um, and that's gonna, what effect did you think that would have on the emerging markets? Well, it would have an amplified effect. If I then said that that's gonna turn around in the developed markets earlier, and they were gonna raise rates, what, ex what would you expect would happen in the emerging markets when that first rate rise occurs? I would expect, well, it would have an outside effect and an adverse con consequence on the developed markets. And then that will, of course, fade and we'll go into a cycle. And again, the troughs for the develop developing markets, emerging markets, will be lower and the highs will be higher. You'd say that in a clinical way. When you're living through it, oh my God, when, it's on, when you're at the highs, it's gonna go higher. And when you're in the troughs, it's never going to recover. And we're at that time now where everyone's wringing their hand. And, you know, in other words, you don't see the century laid out for you. You have to live every year as it comes. And as it comes, you get no reassurance, no assurance that it'll ever be different than what you see. And everyone has a tendency to extrapolate the present and the most immediate past. I think the art of reflecting on business and on cycles. And I think one of the benefits of reading history is it gives you the, it gives you the perspective to see that there are cycles to things. Mm -hmm.